You may be seated. Youth would like to go, can go with Chris. Everywhere, or all over the United States, we find uh, states have put up guardrails on roads. Guardrails are not put in dangerous areas. They're put several feet or yards back from an off-limits area. If you hit a guardrail with your car, you will damage your car. But a, they're meant to protect you from disaster. Now, we can all see the advantages of having guardrails when it comes to driving, but what about constructing guardrails in other areas of our lives where we have far more likelihood of destroying our lives? I mean, we all agree there are certain areas in life where if you cross a line, you hurt yourself. I mean, these are just, these aren't religious things. These are just practical things. So even if you're not religious, uh, you can see the wisdom of constructing guardrails. So today and next week, I thought I would talk with you about what Jesus suggests in the way of guardrails when it comes with our use of money. Jesus talks a lot about money. We've talked the last two weeks about forgiveness. He talks way more about money than he does about forgiveness. Why does he talk about it so much? It's because he knows it's important to us. So turn to Luke 12, 13 to 21. Your phone, your Bible, there are Bibles under the seats in front of you. This is one of Jesus' famous parables, and it's an unusual one because it starts with an explanation of the parable, and then it ends with a further explanation. A lot of Jesus' parables are just, he just tells the story, and there's no explanation. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. Tell us, show us what you meant when you gave this parable and how we should apply it to our lives today. We are very ready to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems to me that the guardrail Jesus suggests is that when it comes to money, the important thing is being rich toward God. Let's look at the guardrails uh, with regard to money. Uh, Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. A younger brother comes to Jesus and says, Would you please talk to my brother? He's taking forever in dividing the inheritance. Now, if you've been involved with uh, the division of an estate, you know that they can take forever, and it often leads to uh, acrimony between siblings. A woman died in Chicago, leaving a sizable estate to her two sons and her daughter. Two of them felt like the estate had been divided unequally, and they were very upset. And so they started arguing with the other brother, and uh, they got, you know, arguing, and, and it got so bad they had their family stop seeing each other, and after a while they were all lawyered up. Well, it got to be Christmas Eve, and they thought, well, just for the sake of the cousins, all these, you know, they've grown up together, just for getting the kids together, we'll all go to Christmas Eve service. And they went to Willow Creek Church in Chicago. And during the singing of Silent Night, Bill Heibel said, why don't you... Uh, go to the family and friends you came with and tell them what they mean to you. And in that process, one of the brothers said to the other two, why don't we stop this insanity over the estate? Well, with Jesus, this brother says, Jesus, help me get my fair share. In response, Jesus cuts to the core of the problem. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Rather than getting embroiled in a family feud, Jesus cuts to the chase because he knows that the root of the problem is greed. Both of these brothers are greedy. The one for not dividing the estate and the other for with his feverish desire to get his hands on it. Now we're ready for the parable. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Nothing's wrong here. Jesus is not saying there's anything wrong with having a, 
a good year financially. He has no issue with success. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. If this man didn't do something with all the money he made that year, he would move into a higher tax bracket. So he built bigger barns. He sunk the money back into the company. Again, Jesus does not suggest any offense has been committed. The man has an unusual problem. He has more money than he knows what to do with. If this is your problem, see me after the service. <laughs> and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The man asks an important question. What should I do with all my money? But he arrives at the worst possible conclusion, to keep it all for himself. He sees his money as something to benefit himself exclusively, not to be used for any purpose other than his own pleasure. Suddenly, this man goes terribly awry because his purpose for storing the wealth is all selfish and has nothing to do with God. He thinks his wealth sets him up to live luxuriously and now he's protected and he doesn't need God. The surprise in the parable is, is that this wealthy man, who by the mere fact that he's wealthy, would be in Jewish society considered a righteous man because God blesses righteous people with wealth, is someone that Jesus calls a fool. The irony of the parable is that when the, the man thinks he is most Set for life, he is the least set. So what guardrails does Jesus suggest for our use of money? I think the main one is when it comes to money, the important thing is to be rich toward God. He tells us the meaning of this parable at the end. Verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. I think Jesus suggests at least three guardrails here for us. Number one, watch out for greed. Verse 15, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I think the problem we might have with this parable is we think, you know, I don't think this relates to me. I'm not involved in an estate division. Uh, I'm not a farmer. I didn't just have a bumper crop. I don't think I have a problem with greed. So this parable isn't for me. But don't we all have a problem with greed? Look at this.
Now, isn't that like us? What happens when you get a little? You want a little more, right? What happens when you get a little more? You want a little more. I mean, I think one way to look at greed today might be to look at what do we have in the way of debts? Many analysts suggest that Americans are swimming in debt. Uh, what is debt? It is reaching into the future, grabbing something you really can't afford, and putting it on credit. Craig Greshel, in his book Soul Detox, tells us that 60% of workers under the age of 30 have already cashed in their retirement. And a whopping 70% of them have no cash reserves whatsoever. As a pastor, I marry a lot of young couples. <clears throat> I'll usually ask them at some point, what are you doing for a honeymoon? Their answer is usually is some exotic place like Kauai or Mexico or Polynesian Islands or some island off the coast of Florida. I said, how are you going to pay for it? And often they'll turn red and we're going to put it on credit. I mean, how un unromantic. Say, honey, what do you say we go deep in debt and have do something that was going to take us years to pay off to have this dream trip? One of the myths of credit cards is that if you pay off your credit card every month, you get the free use of someone else's money. The truth is, CardTrack says that 60% of people don't pay off their credit cards every month. The huge debt our nation is in, 19 trillion and growing, certainly speaks to misguided leadership in Washington, maybe uncourageous leadership. But you know, I think it's kind of a symptomatic of our national sentiment. We would rather spend now and pay later than stick to a budget and wait to buy something until we can afford it. One person wrote, the budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of public leaders should be tempered and controlled. And assistance to foreign countries should be curtailed, lest we go bankrupt. People must again learn to work instead of living on public assistance. Do you know who wrote that? That was Cicero in 55 B.C. in Rome. I mean, some things never change. Jesus says the accumulation of debt all comes from greed. You want more. You've got to have it now. There's no discipline to save. And then when you've got the money, then buy the furniture, or then buy the phone, or then buy the car. You take it now and put it on credit. I suppose we're all smitten with a certain degree of greed. An old miser called together his doctor, lawyer, and pastor. And they gathered around his deathbed. And he says, you know, they say you can't take it with you, but I'd like to try. So at the funeral, I'm going to give you each an envelope here with $30,000 in it. Just before they shut the coffin, I want you to put it in. Well, driving home from the funeral, the pastor said, I, I got to I got to tell you guys, I couldn't do it. I kept back 10000 for our church's benevolence fund. The doctor said, boy, I'm sure glad to hear you say that because I couldn't do it either. I kept back $20,000. we are building a clinic uh, in the inner city for the poor. The lawyer said, boy, I am ashamed at you guys. They said, you put all that money in there? He said, I sure did. I wrote a check for the whole amount. Jesus says, watch out for greed. It can lead you into debt, keep you from saving, bring you a lot of stress when you're living on the edge financially and then the edge disappears and then suddenly you're in panic. Jesus says, this is the guardrail. Avoid the ditch of consumption, going deep into debt, way over your head. It's a terrible way to live with no financial margin. I've always believed that 90% of solving a problem is recognizing you have a problem. If you have a problem with spending more than you earn, 
not waiting to buy until you've saved, then put up Jesus' guardrail. Temper the greed. Number two guardrail I think Jesus suggests here is watch out for pride in wealth. Verse 17, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. So far, the man has done nothing wrong. It's perfectly okay to be successful and have to figure out how to manage your success. 19, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is where he goes terribly wrong. He becomes proud of his accomplishments and figures he is set for life and doesn't need God. When Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, God warned them, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It's easy when we meet with success to become proud and think we don't need God anymore. We got it covered, got enough money. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night... Your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The man could afford the finest in medical care, but he couldn't control the day of his death. The man had everything planned out, but his plans didn't work out so well. He died that night. Jesus calls him a fool. God wants us to use the gifts he's given us. He wants us to get an education. He wants us to work hard. And when we do, we have a right to expect to be compensated for our efforts. But when we are successful, we need to watch out for pride and thinking our money makes us secure. It doesn't. We find our security only in God. We need to depend on Him. Then the third guardrail I think Jesus suggests is when it comes to money, the important thing is to be rich toward God. Verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Jesus says it's foolish to store up things for ourselves but not be rich toward God. It's foolish to think that our money provides us with security. Only God can do that. Jesus asks, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? So how do we become rich toward God? Let me make two suggestions. One, make your relationship with God your top priority. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. He's talking about a whole new orientation. You put God first, his kingdom first, his concerns first, then all these things will provide, be provided for you. You don't put money first and securing yourself first. Yourself first, you put God first. Concerns like his kingdom, his church, ministering to people. And then we trust him to meet our material needs. It's a whole new orientation. So what becomes important? Things like spending time in his word and maybe in our journal. You say, you know what? I'm not going to just march into my day and fly through it. I can take 15 minutes for my relationship with God. And I can take time to pray. It's crazy to think I don't have time to praise God and confess my sins pray through my day, pray for the people significant in my life. I can do that. I can take time for church. If I'm not deathly ill or out of town, I will be here. I'll take time for something more than worship where I get to know people like a community group. Serving in some way so I get to know people. Another way to become rich toward God is give the first percentage of your income back to God. Solomon says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Solomon tells us that we're to give God our first fruits. Now, this was an agrarian society, so they were mostly into farming. They were to give the first part of their crops to God. 
and then live on the rest. You are generous and faithful in giving God the first of your income. And then he is bound by his word to bless and protect you. Here's the promise. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. It's a, it's a promise. You give the first part and I'll take care of you. Even beyond what you can imagine. The standard God sets to give back to him is the first tenth. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former, tithing. Now look closely. The woe on the religious hypocrites is not for their tithing, but for their respect, neglect of justice and mercy. If tithing was unimportant to Jesus, he, would, he could have said, uh, attend to justice and mercy and forget about the tithing. But instead he says, do justice and mercy and tithe. Whenever I talk about giving back to God the first tenth, I realize there are two groups of people in the room. There are those of you who make this your practice. You give God the first tenth or more of your income, and you could come up here right now and say, you know, I made this decision, whatever, years ago, and I've never regretted it. It's been one of the best decisions of my life. I've given, and I've trusted God, and He has faithfully taken care of me. The other group of you would be represented by uh, the person that says, I can't afford to tithe. I have debt up above my eyeballs. There's no way I could give God that amount of money. I would go belly up. This is why I say give the first percentage of your income back to God. If you're not giving anything, then give him the first 1%. Get started. Uh, if you're giving something, bump it up to 3% or 5%. Maybe you're scared, but when you give God, give to God, it, you enter into an adventure of watching him supernaturally provide. You say, okay, God, I don't know if I can afford this, but I'm going to trust your promises and I'm going to give to you, not knowing how I'm going to pay all my bills. And then you watch God provide. And I've seen him do it over and over again. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is a paradox in giving. If you release a percentage of your income, he will give back to you. It's a promise. Now, critics will tell you, I'm urging you to give because of what you'll get back. I've always been amazed at the number of people who object to the promise Jesus makes. But the fact remains that Jesus promises that when we give, he gives back to us. He gives back to us more. And it's all about trust. Do you trust Jesus? If you invest in the stock market, which is about the only place you can invest nowadays, you can't get any interest to speak of at a bank, you, your philosophy is how to make an investment that nets the highest in interest with the least risk. And that's precisely the sort of investment opportunity Jesus offers us. Some people think we're nuts to give back to God 10% or more or a significant percentage because they think that when we give to God, it's gone. That couldn't be more wrong. When we give to God, we're not giving away our money. We're investing it in heaven. We're becoming rich toward God. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The reason Jesus talks so much about money is because he knows how important money is to us and we're likely to store up all our treasure on earth. He wants our heart and he knows his chief competition is our stuff. He knows that as long as we're enamored with getting more stuff on earth, we really haven't comprehended the riches we can know in Christ. 
Apostle Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus gave up all his wealth. He gave up his very life for us so that we may become rich in him. Once we understand how beautiful Jesus is and that a relationship with him is more precious than any things we can accumulate in this world, then we'll no longer, uh, things will no longer have so much power over us. We find the security to give away our wealth since the only real long-term security is in Jesus. We give to God because Jesus gave his life for us. So this is the third guardrail. When it comes to money, the important thing is to become rich toward God. You make God top priority in your life. You give generously to him because your relationship with Christ is the most important relationship you have in the world. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this parable. You probe to the heart of issues that relate to us. You're so practical. Money's a big deal to us. We spend a lot of time earning it, spending it, thinking about it, worrying about it. But we want to respond to what you teach us here. I want to give you a minute just to share. Maybe you can tell God what you learned today. Hey, you don't want to go the greed route and racking up debt. You want to stop that behavior. You don't want to be proud in what you've accumulated and think you're secure without God. And you want to become rich toward Him. Make Him top priority in your life and give a generous percentage back to Him. You tell Him whatever you heard today that you want to respond to Him with. You pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you talk about things that are practical, that are everyday life. And we want to take, take this with us today and put it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, would you pull out your program, What Did Jesus Mean About Money? And inside is a communication card, and uh, Chris mentioned this earlier. We'd like every one of you to let us know that you're here. Give us a record of your attendance. If you're a regular, just your name will do. If you're a guest, uh, as much uh, information as you're willing to give us would be terrific. Halfway down, it says, my next step is to, this is kind of your way of communicating with me, watch out for greed that likely leads me into debt. If you say, yeah, I'm, I'm there on that one, then check that little circle. Uh, watch out for pride in my financial commitments. If you say, yeah, I want to I wanna watch out for that, check that. Give a percentage of my income back to God. If you're willing to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, uh, check that. Take the challenge to do lesson four and what did Jesus mean journal. That's yellow. If you don't have one of these, a uh, host will hand it to you on the way out. I'm committing my life to Christ today for the first time. All right, on the back, there's some things that I want to talk to you about. We're coming up on our biggest part of the year in terms of community, service, and it's going to center around McKay Elementary School right across the street. So they've asked us to help with their carnival. They want 46 people. Uh, they, as they describe their school, there's not a ton of parental support. And so they, they could use all of our help in doing that. So that's a lot of people. And then we have a work day <clears throat> uh, to help clean up their school. And that's on uh, two weeks, uh, Sunday, May 1st. <clears throat> and I'm hoping we have about 50 people. Maybe 25 after the first service, 25 after the second. So that's 100 people. That's nearly half our church. So when I say we need people, I'm talking to you, okay? Look at the person next to you. It's either you or one of you is going to be doing this, okay? You with me? <laughs> this is not the other person in the next row. Um, all right, so uh, tell us what you'd be willing to do. And I'd, I'd really like everybody to consider doing one of these things. Uh, some of you are achievers and you maybe want to do both. But if you'd like to help in the, after the first service working at McKay in two weeks, check that. If you'd like to help in the second service, check that. We're going to come in grubby clothes that day. So. And then if you'd like to help with the carnival, you can help in a game booth. 
You going to do a game booth? You know, throw the, throw the ball and... I, I don't change. I, no. <laughs> oh, oh you're, going, you're going work day? You're doing work day? I'll, I'll do the, 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 the face painting. I'm, okay. I'm, All I'm right. what you call face. a makeup artist. All right, face painting. Uh, I'm going to do the work day, uh, Chuck. Um, you can help uh, with setup, tear down. Okay, they'll train you how to do face painting. So, Jesse, they, you don't need any training. You got, you, can you do it? So, go ahead and check it. All right, I'd like you to do this and then uh, drop it in the offering. I invite the ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our offering in just a minute. Thank you so much for so many of you, so generous. And uh, so, we feel like we can do things in this community and, and, and be a, a help to them. Um, so, let's pray. Father, we thank you for a way we can worship you by giving. This is one way, maybe one of the most important ways we can show how much you mean to us and how much we trust you. And so receive our gifts. And uh, we're gonna trust you on this, Lord, uh, to give to you today and, and trust that you will take care of us and help our meet our other obligations and uh, bless us. So receive our offering, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray.